Good afternoon, students. Today is Saturday, 24 April 2021. This will be our second lecture for this week. After today, we have only three lectures remaining, and all three of them will be on the essay by Jubilini and Minerva. So that essay is now posted on Canvas, and you should start reading it. <clears throat> our first lecture next week will probably be on, well, it may be as late as Thursday. I have a meeting on Wednesday. I have to do my ethics lecture probably on Tuesday. <clears throat> so maybe your lectures next week will be Thursday and Saturday, but you will get two lectures next week. Um, <clears throat> so before Thursday next week, make sure you've read at least half of the essay by Jubilini and Minerva. <clears throat> Today is our final day of two on the essay by Jan Narvison. Remember, he's a libertarian like John Hospers. When we begin the next essay, you will discover that it is a defense of infanticide. The authors don't call it infanticide, but if infanticide means killing of a human infant, then that's what it is. They prefer the term after birth abortion, which may sound humorous to you. And we'll ask when we get to that essay, why do they choose that name for the procedure? Why not just call it infanticide? Um, our exam is in 17 days. It's coming up fast. It's on the 11th of May, so make sure you get it on your calendar. <coughs> I plan to post lecture notes for Jubilini and Minerva sometime in the next couple of days, today or tomorrow probably. So look for that. And then when we get to that essay, you can follow along by looking at my lecture notes. So let's get back to Narvison. We need to finish it today. Let's begin with what Narvison calls the insurance argument, or perhaps I give it that name, the insurance argument. He does discuss insurance. It's an argument in favor of positive rights, a positive right to health care. So why don't we just let Narvison speak first, and then we'll discuss what he says. I'd like to read to you from page 563 of his essay. You can see mine's all marked up. Here's what he says. He says, more plausibly, at first sight, there is an insurance argument. Maybe we would all do well to contribute to a fund which would pay for anybody's medical care if needed. Up to some level, hence the relevant minimum. Here the problem is in the word maybe. Maybe we would, but maybe we would not. If we would, why would we do well to do so? Society contains a range of people in respect of the ability to produce what is socially useful. So-called social insurance looks like a bad investment from the point of view of producers. Insurance that actually is insurance, that is, where the individual is responding rationally to risks, is of course often a good idea, which is why wealthy societies are awash in insurance companies. But compulsory society-wide insurance is another matter. Those who find it obvious that such things are justified should engage in some real analysis and argument instead of just proclaiming it, as is, overwhelmingly, the current tendency. Okay, that's the first paragraph. I'm going to read the second one in a moment, but let me make a couple of comments. Notice the sarcastic tone in Narvison's voice. He has very little patience for what he calls fascists, or what I prefer to call collectivists or statists. He, he ridicules the idea of compulsory society-wide insurance. He's going to go on to say that compulsory insurance is not really insurance at all. Insurance, by its very nature, is a voluntary undertaking. People voluntarily in response to risks that they face, purchase insurance. And insurance companies arise to cater to those demands. In a free marketplace, there will be insurance for things like houses, automobiles, and various other, and health, health care. Um, but individuals should be able to purchase or not purchase it as they see fit. What he doesn't like is compulsory insurance. 
even if that's a meaningful term, he's opposed to it. So let's read the second paragraph. He says, we are, in short, safe in asserting the human natural rights, security of persons and possessions, recognition of transfers by consent only, and reliability of contracts. Those are the basic functions of government, according to libertarians. Remember, Hospers, the government's function is to protect us from each other and to protect us from external enemies. The government will have to have a criminal justice system and a tort system. The government will have to enforce contracts. If two people voluntarily enter into a contract with one another, then it, that contract will be enforced, enforced by the government against either one of the parties. So if you breach a valid contract, the, you will be sued, and if the person suing you prevails, you will have to make good on your promise. You will have to do whatever the contract specified that you do, or pay a sum of money to compensate the party whose contract was breached. None of these Narvison writes assures or even makes it particularly plausible that we should impose on all who can pay the duty of providing these various goods and services to persons who cannot produce enough to pay for them themselves. Charitable assistance to our fellows in time of need? Yes. But compulsory assistance, as with taxation? Not obviously. Now, he would go further than that. Not only is it not obviously true that compulsory insurance is justified, he would say it's false. But at a minimum, it's not obviously true. Someone who believes that there should be compulsory insurance has to argue for it. Right? He has to make a case for it. He says, appeals to the word insurance cash in on an obviously good idea. Most of us want insurance against some things. But as soon as it, it, is, as soon as it is made compulsory, the idea loses its appeal. We can see why insurance purchases might be a good idea. But if they are, then we will choose to take out that kind of insurance and make those payments. So if insurance is a good idea, rational individuals will purchase an insurance policy and pay premiums for it. It will be voluntary. Compulsion, he says, takes the steam out of its appeal. Nobody likes to be coerced or compelled to do something against his or her will. Indeed, he says, it is a familiar co contradiction of the welfare state to argue, quote, hey, this is such a good thing that of course you want it. Therefore, we will make you take it. The conclusion, he says, is inconsistent with its premise. If we think that it is good, I'm sorry, if we think it that good, we will buy it of our own free will. If we must be compelled to take it, then evidently we do not think it is all that good. So Narvison is reminding his readers that insurance, by its very nature, is voluntary. It's, it's rational individuals who have valuable property or valuable things like their lives will take out insurance and pay a premium. We buy life insurance. Right? We all know we're going to die. We don't know when. Um, we purchase a life insurance policy. We pay premiums on a regular basis to the life insurance company. And when we die, not if we die, but when we die, the insurance company will pay a specified sum of money to whomever we name as the beneficiary on that policy. So life insurance is something we do to protect our loved ones, and we name them as our beneficiaries. So that's something people voluntarily purchase. Not everybody, of course, but many people do. We purchase insurance on our homes and, uh, and our property. Um, a home, for most people, represents a significant asset. It's, it's a, it, it, it incorporates a great deal of resources and wealth that was accumulated over a long period of time, typically. Now, are you willing to risk your house burning to the ground? If your house were to burn to the ground through arson or a lightning strike or faulty appliances or, or carelessness by someone in the house, if your house were to burn to the ground, destroying it and everything in it, 
if you don't have insurance to compensate you for it, you will have to start over. It could be several hundred thousand dollars that you've invested in your house. And if it is destroyed, then you have nothing uh, left of it. You're starting over. Most people are not willing to, to bear that risk. It may be that your house never suffers any damage. You would then be lucky. But most people don't like taking the chance. They find that a risk that's not worth taking. So what they do is they contract with a home insurance company to, uh, to pay payments, premiums on a regular basis. And then if and when your home is destroyed, the insurance company will pay to have a replacement home built for you. So most people are quite happy voluntarily to purchase insurance. Yes, you're going to have to pay premiums once a year or once every six months or whatever your term is, but most people find that a good bargain. Uh, many people take out health insurance. There are health insurance companies, and many people want to insure against health catastrophes. What if you contract an illness that prevents you from working? and incurs great, a great many medical costs. Your insurance company, for which you have paid premiums, your insurance company will pay some or all of those costs for you. So you won't go broke. You won't have to sell your house to pay your medical costs, and that sort of thing. So what about your car? Many people, especially people who have nice cars, want to insure them against various risks. If someone runs into you, destroying or damaging your car. Most people can't afford to repair it or replace it, so they have purchased auto insurance to have the car either replaced or repaired. So here are three or four types of insurance, homeowner's insurance, auto insurance, health insurance, and there are lots of other kinds of insurance. And people voluntarily pay premiums in order to stave off catastrophe or disaster. Nobody makes you buy insurance though. Those forms of insurance I just mentioned are voluntary. You may purchase them if you want, but you don't have to. Now there is a special type of insurance and you could actually use this as a basis for a health care, uh, a, a positive right to health care argument. Um, as you probably know, states like Texas require that you have a certain amount of liability insurance for your car. What that means is uh, if you um, injure somebody while driving, that person will suffer damages and you um, having had to purchase liability insurance, your insurance company will pay that person to compensate that person for the damage that you caused. And the states make that kind of insurance mandatory. Okay? They make you have enough insurance to pay off people whom you have uh, damaged or injured. That's mandatory. That part of auto insurance is mandatory. Even if you choose not to purchase what's called comprehensive auto insurance to replace your car, you still have to have liability insurance. Now, what's the argument for that? The argument is that people we don't want people to impose costs on others. We want everyone to be able to compensate anyone that they wrongfully injure while driving. Maybe an argument like that could be made for health care. If people choose not to have health care coverage and they get sick or injured, they're probably going to go to the emergency room. In the emergency room, many emergency rooms around the country, by law, have to provide medical assistance to those in need. And if they can't pay for it, then the hospital itself will have to pay for it. And of course, those costs get passed on to the people who go to the hospital and do have health insurance or are able to pay their health care costs. So people who are uninsured impose costs on the rest of us. So I'm suggesting a particular argument that might justify a mandate to purchase health care coverage, right? And the, the argument is that if you don't have health care, you will probably end up imposing costs on everybody. And you have no right to do that. So the law says you have to have some degree of health care to provide for yourself. 
right? I'm not saying that is the law, but an argument could be made that that would be justified, and the analogy would be to liability insurance for automobiles. Now, Narvison thinks that statists, or what he calls fascists, are presumptuous. He thinks that they um, assume, they simply assume that there is a right to some amount of health care. Look what he says on page 564 about this. He says in the second full paragraph, square one in this discussion, of course, should be occupied by some thought on the matter of rights. When people talk of a right to a decent minimum, etc., what do they have in mind? In context, it is clear that current discussions among academics, in the United States in particular, have in mind the amount of health care, notice he put that word amount in quotation marks, the amount of health care that your fellow citizens may be required in the form of taxation to purchase for you. It is presumed, in brief, that we have what is now known as a positive right against our fellow citizens to some amount of health care. The only real question being, how much? Now that's presumptuous. Notice he used the word presumed. It, you're presumptuous when you take something for granted that is actually debatable and controversial. So Narvison is saying that many people, when they discuss health care, just take it for granted that there's a right to health care. And the only question they're interested in is, how much health care do you have a right to? Well, Narvison wants to go back to that first question, which he thinks is a real question, and it needs to be answered, and the answer to it must be justified. He says, uh, the presumption has to be challenged. We may insist that to that particular question, there's only one plausible answer, none. This, one gathers, is not an acceptable answer in current discussions, unsurprisingly to students of government and political processes. But any other answer needs to tell us why people should be compelled to pay for other people's health care at the proposed level. So Narvison appears to have what's called a presumption in favor of liberty, right? And that's typical of liberals, classical liberals. They presume or take it for granted that individuals have freedom or liberty. And that means that the burden of proof, or at least the burden of argumentation, is on those who wish to limit liberty. Right? We'll call that the presumption in favor of liberty. And so Narvison thinks that the, the cart has gotten before the horse, and that's called begging the question. The, the first question we should ask Narvison thinks, is, is there a positive right to health care? And if so, what justifies it? That's the most basic question. And only if we answer that question, yes, yes, there is a positive right to health care, only then do we go on and ask, to what is the right, to how much health care do we have a right to? Right? What's the quantity? Is it a decent minimum only, or is it a more robust package of health care? So Narvison is trying to do what philosophers traditionally do, which is go back to the beginning and ask the most basic questions first, and then kind of work your way forward. So I have in my notes on page three, if you are reading along with me, you'll see that there's an analogy. Um, I have four kind of skeptical positions, anarchists, libertarians, skeptics, and agnostics or atheists. So let's read what I wrote here. An anarchist in political philosophy doubts or denies the legitimacy of government. Now, most people simply take it for granted that government is legitimate. You're probably one of them. But an anarchist gets to ask the question, is government really legitimate? And if you think it is, what argument can you give in support of that? position. So anarchists force people to confront this difficult question. Is government legitimate? And if so, why? A libertarian doesn't doubt the legitimacy of government, but a libertarian doubts or denies the legitimacy of big government. Remember, anarchists and libertarians are different. Anarchists deny the legitimacy of government, period, 
libertarians deny not the legitimacy of government per se, but the legitimacy of big, expansive government with welfare payments and mandates and other things that libertarians consider infringements of liberty. A skeptic, a doubter, is someone who doubts or denies the possibility of knowledge. There have always been skeptics like this in the history of philosophy. And some of the great works of philosophy grapple with this question. All right? Is knowledge possible? Or is a particular kind of knowledge possible, like moral knowledge or scientific knowledge? Okay? Most people take it for granted that we can know things and that we do know things. But a skeptic insists that we address that question. Do we really know anything? If so, what do we know and why do we know it? How is it possible to know things, given that we're fallible, for example, given that, that our senses sometimes mislead us? And finally, in religion, there have always been agnostics or atheists who doubt or deny the existence of God. So even if most people take it for granted that there's a God, still an agnostic or atheist can challenge that belief and, and ask, what are the grounds or reasons to believe that there's a God? What's the evidence? And that calls, that puts the burden on the theist to make a case, make an argument for why God exists or why it's rational to believe that God exists. So Narvison is working in the grand philosophical tradition of skepticism. He's simply asking people who believe that there's a positive right to health care. Okay, what's the basis of it? Um, surely if there's a positive right, you can come up with reasons to support it, grounds for it, um, make your case, and I'll see whether the argument is any good. So Narvison thinks the cart has gotten before the horse. That's what he means by begging the question. The, the real question, the first question is, is there a positive right to health care? And only if we say yes to that should we move on and ask, how much health care do we have a right to? You remember Sarah Conley's essay with which we began this course? She took it for granted that there's a right to health care. The goal of her essay was to show that that, health, that that right has to have limits. That doesn't mean that there is no right to health care. She believes that there is, but she's trying to describe the limits on that right. And the limits are caused by the fact that health care is expensive. And we, we can't have all the health care we want. So difficult decisions must be made. And one of those limits on health care has to do with individual responsibility or personal responsibility. You remember Conley arguing that each of us is responsible for our own health. If you let yourself get overweight, and therefore more likely to draw upon health care resources, perhaps the government should limit your right to those resources. Right? You have, there are things government can and should do to hold people responsible for their own health care decisions. So that, that was the purpose of Conley's essay, to try to focus on where we draw the line on health care. She just took it for granted that there is a right to health care. All right, now let's talk about, I said earlier in our first discussion of Narvison, we're going to come back to the question of what healthcare systems actually exist in certain countries. So if you look at the chart on the top of page four of my lecture notes, you'll see I made a diagram or a chart for you. And on the left side, I have positive or universal, a positive universal right to health. And down below it, no positive right. So in a particular society at a particular time, either there is a positive universal right to health care or there isn't. It's got to be one or the other. And notice I put the word universal in there. I'm, I'm not saying that there's a, a positive right for certain people or most people. I'm talking about a society where everyone universally has a positive right to health care. Okay? Now, on the top, you can see that I wrote negative right to health and no negative right to health. Now, if I were to redo this diagram, I would slip a word in there just to clarify. I would say, on the left, I would say robust negative right to health. And then on the right, I would say no robust negative right to health. 
And by a robust negative right, I mean one that has all three aspects of a negative right. Do you remember earlier our discussion of what a negative right includes? Three things, okay, three things. First, it includes a right to, with, to refuse medical treatment. If I have a negative right to health, that means at a minimum that I have a right to refuse any health care treatment or any medical treatment. I can say, no, I don't want surgery or I don't want that drug. Leave me alone. Secondly, a negative right to health care is a right not to be injured, not to have your health harmed by other people, your health or your life. It says, leave me alone. Don't stab me or poison me or do anything else that adversely affects my health and well-being. So that's the second aspect of a negative right. The third aspect of a negative right is a right to be left alone so that you can contract with whomever you please to take care of your health. You can go see any doctor and enter into an arrangement with that doctor to provide health care for you. Okay, so let's say, let's call a negative right a robust negative right if it includes all three of those components. And let's call a negative right not robust when it includes something less than all three of those. One and two, but not three, for example. Okay, so here's what I want you to do. Just to clarify my own diagram uh, on page, top of page four, across the top, you should write in the word robust. It should read robust negative right to health. And of course, when you move over to the right of that, you've got to put that same word in there. No robust negative right to health. Are you with me? So I'm asking you to put the word robust in in those two places. And now I think the diagram is more complete, right? It's more airtight. And that's my goal. So let's take a look at what I've done here. I've made two distinctions, one, one across the left and one on top. And these two distinctions cross over like this, creating four cells or boxes. And I'm able to fill in three of the four with actual countries. And you'll see that I've written Great Britain in the northwestern box or cell. I wrote in USA in the southeastern, I'm sorry, the southwestern box. And I wrote in Canada in the northeastern box. I put a question mark in the fourth box. I can't think of any government that has that combination. And it's not important that we even talk about that. I just want to distinguish the US from Great Britain and Canada, those three. And you'll see they're different as well as similar. So let's look at Great Britain. What's the current system in Great Britain? In Great Britain today, there is a, a positive universal right to health care. And by Great Britain, I mean England, Wales, Scotland, uh, Northern Ireland, the British Isles, such as the Isle of Man, and so on. Okay, that's all called Great Britain. Great Britain has a national health care system, and everyone in Great Britain has a positive right to health care. Okay, they, they take great pride in that. It's a costly system, but maybe not as costly as the system in the United States, for example. Because in Great Britain, the government administers health care. And in the United States, for example, we have many different insurance companies and hospitals. We have lots of paperwork and regulations. And that eats up a lot of resources. In Great Britain, since they have one, just the government administering the whole system, they can have a lot of efficiency gains or advantages. And that lowers the cost of health care. So in Great Britain, first of all, there's a positive universal right to health care. They also have a robust negative right to health care. And go back to what that means now. That means all three aspects are included. You have a right to refuse treatment in Great Britain. You have a right not to be injured or harmed in ways that adversely affect your health. And most importantly, in Great Britain, you have a right to go outside the system if you want. You have, you have a right under the law to go into the governmental health care system and get treated. But some people, if they have the means and want to avoid perhaps wait times or long lines, or if they just have a preferred doctor, 
you can go contract with your own doctor and get treatment and pay for it. Okay? You, you have to pay for it yourself if you choose that route. Many people think that's a perfect system. And I won't weigh in on that, but everyone has a right to health care through the government system. And if you have the resources and you want to arrange for your own private care um, part of the time or all of the time, you're free to do so. So notice Great Britain is in the box where it's bo there's both a positive universal right to health care and a robust negative right. Let's turn to Canada now. In Canada today, there's a similarity between Canada and Great Britain, and that is that there is a positive universal right to health care. Everyone in Canada has a right to go into the governmental system for health care. It's a single payer system, which means there's one payer, the government, who pays for all the health care costs. The difference between Great Britain and Canada today is that there is no robust negative right to health care in Canada. And that's why I hope you can see now why I wanted to put the word robust in there. Robust means it has all three aspects of a negative right. In Canada, you have a right to refuse treatment, of course, and you have a right not to be harmed. But you don't have a right in Canada to go contract with a doctor for your own privately um, supplied medical care. You can't, even if you're willing and able to pay for your own doctor, you can't do it in Canada. You have to go through the national health care system. That's true of the Prime Minister of Canada, Trudeau, Justin Trudeau, and everyone else. There's, and Canadians take great pride in that, and you could probably figure out why. In Canada, everybody goes through the same health care system. It doesn't matter whether you are in a low-skilled job or unemployed, or whether you're at the very top of government, a powerful individual, or a very wealthy person. If you're fabulously wealthy, you still have to go for your health care through the system. Now, having said that, it's not unheard of for Canadians who are wealthy to go to other countries for health care. There's nothing to my knowledge in Canadian law that prevents that. So you can fly to another country, such as the United States, and get treated and pay for it. But you can't do that inside Canada. That's against the law. Now, Narvison, of course, living in Canada all these years and being a libertarian, he must be constantly frustrated. I think he would be happier if he lived in the United States. And he probably would be happier if he lived in Great Britain, because at least in Great Britain, you can go contract for your own health care if you want and can afford it. Okay, so I'm not belittling this Canadian system at all. They're, they're proud of it. Maybe they're rightly proud of it. They view it as a great accomplishment that they're able to provide medical care to everyone, no questions asked, and that no one is treated better than other people. Right? Wealthy and powerful do not have any advantages when it comes to health care. Of course, remember what I said, they can fly to another country and get treatment. Okay, look, where's the USA in this diagram? You can see I've written it in in the southwest quadrant of the diagram. In the United States today, and this could change, it could change soon. There's been a big debate about health care for at least three decades now in this country. There is no, currently no positive universal right to health care. Right? We do not have a single payer system, and there's no, uh, there's no right. There are people today in this country who have no health care coverage. I don't know what the percentage is, but there are people who slip through the cracks. Many of us have health care. Some of it have it provided by our employers, such as me. Right? I, I'm a, an employee of the state of Texas. I work at UTA, a public university. And part of my compensation package is health care for myself and my dependents. And I value it greatly. I'm very lucky. Many people have health care through their employers like that. But not everyone does. Some people, don't, some people are self-employed. Or, or work for an employer who doesn't provide health care coverage, they have to come up with the money to pay premiums for their own health care. And many of them do. They may do so grudgingly. They may wish they had an employer who offered a health care plan, 
um, but they have made a decision to purchase health care insurance on their own and pay the premiums because they don't want to bear the risk of having a catastrophic injury or illness. And finally, there are people who perhaps would like to have health care coverage, but they either don't have, an, they, they don't have an employer who provides it and they can't pay the premiums for their own policy. So they're left with no health care coverage. What do they do when they get sick or injured? Invariably, they go to the nearest emergency room and get treated. Now, there are problems with that. Uh, most states have laws that say you can't turn away people who show up at the emergency room, even if they can't pay for it or can't pay for any of their treatment. But of course, the hospital, as I said earlier today, the hospital will um, have to um, charge everyone else a little more to make up for the costs of treating the uninsured, the people who can't pay, the indigent, we'll call them. Um, and so we all end up paying more because some people among us don't have health care coverage or, or can't pay for their health care. So the United States has no positive universal right to health care. That doesn't mean nobody has health care coverage. I think the percentage of people who have <clears throat> some amount or some kind of health care coverage is pretty high, but it's not universal. That's why the USA is in the second row. Okay. Now, where do we fall in the other uh, the other dimension, negative rights, well, we're with Great Britain. In the United States, you're always free not only to ref refuse treatment, you're, you have a right, a negative right not to be harmed by others, and you have a negative right to be left alone so that you can contract with your own health care provider, your own doctor. So, like Great Britain, we have a robust negative right to health care, and both of us differ from Canada in that regard. Great Britain and Canada are alike in that both of them have a positive universal right to health care, and they're both unlike the United States in that regard. <clears throat> so it's an interesting question, what will happen down the road? Um, we're probably closer to univers a universal, pos sorry, a positive universal right to health care now than we've ever been in this nation's history, but Close is, what are they, what's the old saying? Close doesn't count except in hand grenades and horseshoes. Um, we may be close, but maybe it'll still not happen uh, for a very long time. We'll, we'll just have to wait and see. Many people are pushing for a positive universal right to health care. And people are making arguments for and against it. I'm sure Narvison would weigh in and argue that they're there should not be a um, positive universal right to health care. As a libertarian, he believes in small government. He believes that individuals are responsible for their own health. If you're wondering what libertarians say about those people who can't afford health care coverage or to pay for their health care as the need arises, Narvison says that we will do what we always did in, this, in countries like the United States. Charitable institutions have stood up and taken care of the needy. Now, you could argue that they haven't done so very well or completely, and it's not good enough, but Narvison would say it's, it's, it's as good as we're going to get. Otherwise, we're going to have to compel people to provide other people with health care. And as a libertarian, he's opposed to that. So Narvison would support voluntary philanthropic, charitable institutions. And maybe we should encourage them by giving them tax deductions. If you want to encourage people to do something, give them a tax deduction for it. If you want people to donate money to these charitable healthcare institutions, then give them a tax write-off so that any, any dollars that they contribute to these charitable institutions comes off their taxes. That gives people a self-interested reason to do good things, morally good things. And I think libertarians can support that. After all, they want taxes to go down. They think taxes are already too high. So a tax break for people who give to charity would be a good thing in their view. Okay, I, I find it interesting on page 566, Narvison says there's a certain trend in this country 
uh, or in Canada as well. The trend, I'm quoting now, the trend of the times toward centrally enforced entitlement uh, with clangorous appeals to political and politicized audiences. Now, the word clangorous means a continuous loud banging or ringing sound. So imagine I had a pot here and a, and a, um, um, what, a spatula, and I'm banging on the pot constantly. That's a clangorous sound. It would be very annoying after a while, wouldn't it? Well, it's interesting that Narvison used that word because he obviously thinks that the people who are in favor of a positive universal right to health care just keep banging the drum nonstop. And it's libertarians like Narvison who have to say, stop it, right? Stop banging on your drum. Make a case for a positive right. Don't just assume it. Don't presume it. Uh, don't uh, just... Uh, you know, make political noise about it, make a philosophical argument for it at a minimum. So what explains the trend toward mandated health care coverage, centralized government entitlements? Um, well, there are a lot of possible explanations. If you're cynical, you might consider vote buying. People want health care coverage. Politicians understand that this is true for most people. Imagine a politician, uh, in effect, saying, if you vote for me, then I will vote for mandatory health care coverage, univer positive universal health care. In, in effect, it's vote buying. I give you, you vote for me, I get you health care. And remember that if government is supplying health care to some, it's taking money from others. Okay? It's robbing Peter to pay Paul. And that's what libertarians don't like about government mandates and government compulsion. Right? It's not voluntary. They want all transactions to be voluntary. Okay, let's move on to the section of the essay entitled Insurance. We have a few things to say about that. There are two things, according to Narvison and other libertarians, that never need any justification. Charity, because it's voluntary, and insurance, also because it's voluntary. So you don't need to justify these if you're a libertarian. The presumption in favor of freedom takes care of them. You're always free to do uh, interact with other people on a voluntary basis. So if a group of people who are concerned about a certain risk, like their house being destroyed, if a group of people pool their money in the form of an, paying an insurance company for premiums, and, um, and then if one of them loses a house, there's a pot of money available to rebuild a house for that person. So that's kind of a primitive insurance scheme, isn't it? A group of people each pay a sum of money, and that, would, that could be a lot of money, and chances are very good that not all of their houses are going to be destroyed at the same time. So uh, as soon as someone's house is destroyed, then a, some of the money that's in the pot will be taken to rebuild that person's home. So that's the purpose of putting money into the pot. That's, that's one way to think of insurance. It's risk pooling to, uh, to spread the risk around. Since no one person wants to bear the whole risk, spread it around, but each of you is going to have to pay a certain amount to provide the pot of money from which the claims come. Um, now, I discuss in this paragraph, if you look at my notes, I discussed a point I made earlier. Uh, you could argue that since the uninsured impose costs on the rest of us, uh, it would be justifiable for government to mandate liability insurance uh, some amount of health insurance as a form of liability to protect people from imposing costs on others when they get sick or injured. Government makes each person have at least a minimum insurance policy to cover basic injuries and illnesses. And you could argue that that's analogous to liability insurance for cars. Now, I'm not sure what Narvison would say about that analogy. One possibility is that he would say, that government-mandated liability insurance for cars is also unjustified. We shouldn't force people to take out an insurance policy to cover 
the damage that they do to other drivers. Right? If, if comprehensive auto insurance is voluntary, then, then liability insurance should be voluntary. That's an option available to Narvison and other libertarians. They could argue against liability insurance, mandatory liability insurance. So that argument could go either way. You could say that liability, the analogy to auto liability insurance supports a mandate by government that everyone have at least a minimal amount of health care coverage. Or you could, to be consistent, argue that no mandated liability insurance is justifiable, even for cars, even for drivers. No, Narvison doesn't say much about it in this essay, so I don't know what his view would actually be. I'm saying he could make that argument. It would be a consistent way to avoid the analogy. Is there a human right to health care? That's the next question. Narvison, as you could probably predict, says no. Let's read a little bit from page 567, the second full paragraph on that page. He says, an argument is needed for any such program then, and what might it be? Some assert rather cavalierly that there's a human right of this positive type to health care. A human right. We haven't used that term yet. We've been talking about rights, positive rights, negative rights. Some people refer to human rights. Now, for one thing, Narvison says, they perhaps have not appreciated the implication of that view, namely that we are all responsible for the health care of everyone, all seven billion of us. Now, at the time he wrote this, there were about seven billion people on earth, humans, seven billion humans. If there's a positive universal right to health care, that covers all human beings, that would be truly universal, not universal within a particular nation like ours, but worldwide. Think about the cost of that in the administration of that. Narvinson says, if we suppose as we should, that most of them are quite unable to pay for anything at all close to American standards, the implication looms large that America would be stuck with a health care bill considerably in excess of its gross national product, huge though that is. In other words, it would swamp the amount of that we spend on everything else in our society, education, transportation, defense, and so on. He says very few advocates of government-provided health care are ready to swallow that implication. Their proposals tend to be confined in their reach to citizens or residents of their own country. People on the other side of the national boundary are not covered, despite being at least equally in need of care. And you might throw in there, at least equally human. Thus, the proposal that there is a positive human right to such care does not, at least, reflect the realistic spectrum of political opinion, nor of any other kind of opinion short of the slightly lunatic one would think. Now there's another example of Narvison trying to be witty, but it's really a form of disparagement. He's, he's saying pretty clearly that anyone who advocates a human right to universal, I'm sorry, a universal positive right to all humans on earth to health care is, is a lunatic, lunacy. And that's disrespectful at a minimum. Now maybe Maybe there's not a good case for such a claim, but it doesn't mean you're a lunatic if you attempt it. Okay, let's turn to the next section. Uh, you'll see in my notes at the very bottom of page four, I have a right against one's government. Narvinson says that this idea that we have rights against our government for health care verges on fascism. There's that word again, fascism. He likes... He likes name-calling, calling his opponents fascists, in part because that term has a negative connotation. I would prefer it as a philosopher if he would use the term collectivist or something less loaded, a non-loaded term. I don't think the word collectivist has nearly the negative connotation of the word fascist. So he must be using the word fascist either to insult his opponents or he's trying to get a rhetorical advantage in the debate. 
by labeling them in a way that makes people um, turn against them. If all you hear about someone is that that person's a fascist, you probably have a negative opinion of that person, right? Without knowing anything about that person or that person's views. All you know is that someone's called that person a fascist. You might say, well, maybe there's something to that. It's bad to be a fascist. And maybe there's some truth to the allegation that that person's a fascist. So I'd better be wary of that person. I'd better look carefully at that person's views and beliefs and values and arguments. Now, Narvison is wrong if he thinks that the idea of rights against the government is incoherent or preposterous. We in this country, the United States, and he's well aware of this, we have rights against government. The Bill of Rights of our Constitution sets forth a great many individual rights, and these are rights not against other individuals, but against the government, the, the national government and the state governments in which we live, in the states in which we live, and against local governments. So we have federal government, state governments, local governments. We have rights against all of them under the Constitution. And Narvison surely is aware of that. Now, the Bill of Rights confers primarily, if not exclusively, negative rights. We have a right that government leave us alone and not necessarily that government provide us with, with things. Now, there are exceptions. In the Fourth Amendment, people, uh, or I think it's the Fifth Amendment, people have a right to the assistance of counsel. The Supreme Court has interpreted language of the Bill of Rights so that people who cannot afford an attorney will have one provided to them at government expense. So that's a positive right. You have a right not only to be free to hire your own attorney, that would be a negative right, but you have a positive right to an attorney if you can't afford it. You may be familiar with the Miranda rights that, that must be read to every uh, person who is being charged with a crime or who's been arrested. The police are required to recite to you, we'll see whether I can do it from memory. You have the right to be, remain silent. You have the right to um, an attorney. If you cannot afford an attorney, one will be provided to you at public expense. I may have left out part of it, may have changed a word here or there, but that's the gist of the Miranda warning. Every police officer has it memorized and, and knows that it must be read to the criminal suspect early on in the interrogation. And some people, having had their rights read to them, say, I refuse to answer. I want to speak to my attorney. I want an attorney. Okay, I'm not going to answer any questions until I do. So I just wanted to comment on that. Um, it, it's not incoherent at all. It's perfectly coherent and meaningful to say that we have rights against government. And if we have rights against government, then why can't we have positive rights against government? These would be a right that the government provide us with things like health care or housing or food if we can't provide it for ourselves. Now, what kind of insurance will people choose? You now know that Narvison advocates a voluntary system of insurance. People should be free to uh, contract with an insurance company for their home, their automobile, their lives, or their health, or anything else, and they should be able to re refrain from doing so if that's their choice. So let's look at pages 5, 68, and 9 and see what Narvison says. What kind of a system does a libertarian envisage regarding health care? Okay, there's a little, I'm going to read the paragraphs beginning with at any rate. So listen carefully, and I'll, after I read it, we'll talk about it. At any rate, let us imagine our way into a regime of health insurance. What might it best be like? First, it should be very sensitive to its status as insurance. In principle and normally, insurance is voluntary. You decide whether to buy it and how much in negotiation with providers or fellow members of insurance groups. Okay, that's point number one. He wants a voluntary system of insurance. But second, insofar as any case is to be made for compulsory insurance, such insurance is best understood as insuring against the risk 
that unforeseeable or uncontrollable external factors present, such as ambient viruses, COVID, COVID-19, or subtle genetic environmental features that affect the human genome. Thus, the bad habits of many people that leave them with heart disease, lung cancer, and so on, should not obviously be insurable, or perhaps better, should be insurable only at actuarially derived higher premiums. No one should be in the position that his fellows can exact payments from others for avoidable, voluntarily imposed risks. Thus, smokers, persons with dangerous lifestyles, or persons with bad diets should pay more. Those who cannot afford this cannot afford their lifestyles. So why then should others be paying for them? So he seems to be saying here, even if we accept a compulsory system of insurance, now he's against that, but even if we concede that some amount of compulsory insurance is acceptable, the premiums should vary depending on the lifestyle and decisions and choices made by the insured. So now there's going to have to be some way to ascertain these things. The, the insurance company or the government will have to find out who are the smokers. Smokers impose risks on the rest of us. They in, incur greater health care costs and they are therefore creating a, a more expensive health care system. And we all have to pay more in taxes because of the bad decisions made by smokers. And also, he talks about dangerous lifestyles, people who engage in dangerous activities that leave them injured. Uh, and he's talking about people with bad diets, people who don't exercise or who eat a bad diet or eat too much. They should pay more. And that, notice this how this connects up with Sarah Conley's essay which is the first essay we discussed in this course, they would seem to agree that if insurance coverage is mandatory, then we should take into account the costs that people incur and impose on the rest of us, and they should have to pay more for it, for their insurance coverage. He says, the force of this restriction should not be underestimated. It has been plausibly claimed that by far the majority of major causes of death currently, heart attacks, diabetes, stroke, and many cancers would be avoided by modest attention to exercise and diet and avoidance of smoking and a few other things. An insurance policy that provided cover for emergencies but greatly increased costs for those who insist on being overweight, smoking, or prolonged inactivity would be rational. Now let me stop there before I continue reading. I ne neglected a moment ago in the first part of that quotation, I neglected his main point, which is if we have compulsory insurance at all, it should cover only emergencies. It should cover catastrophic events. It shouldn't cover routine health maintenance, things like vaccinations, uh, ant antibiotics, prescription drugs, and so on. Those are routine and recurring, and individuals should pay for those out of their own pocket. Mandatory health coverage should not cover that kind of thing. It should be reserved for uh, illnesses or diseases that impose significant costs on the individual. You can think of those that as catastrophic health care coverage. And Narvison seems to be saying that if any kind of compulsory insurance exists, it should cover that kind of thing. Okay, continuing, those who adhere to known guidelines in respect of a healthy lifestyle can have modest health care costs even in today's expensive world. But involuntary collective health care systems provide little or no incentive for such savings. So the question is, why should those who take reasonable care be stuck with the costs of those who do not? That's the question libertarians always ask. Why should one person have to pay for uh, other people's costs or predicament or injury or illness? We should each be responsible for ourselves first and foremost. And if we, if we want to be generous and charitable to others, that's up to us. 
And in fact, he goes on to make that point. Others may, of course, take pity on them, but the exaction of charity, that exaction means forced charity, is a contradiction in, ter in terms, as well as bad social policy. Normal people have considerable reserves of charitable sentiment, and those sentiments do impel them to philanthropy if they can afford it. Philanthropy literally means it's fill. It's from the words fill, which means love of, and anthropos, which means humanity. So literally, a philanthropist is a lover of humanity, someone who is motivated to do good for others, other humans, and has the means to do so. And there are great philanthropists in society, and we should all celebrate them. Bill Gates, for example, Bill and his wife Melinda have created a foundation and donated a great deal of, his, of their wealth to it, and their foundation does a lot of good in the world. They're great philanthropists, and there are many others of that sort, not to neglect anyone, but I just named Bill Gates. The United States has been the world's leader in private charitable giving by a very large magnitude for a very long time. And it is to that resource we should turn for dealing with the unfortunate who are also financially unfortunate. But why should other people in general be saddled with expensive mandatory health policies for their irresponsible neighbors? So that connects with a point I made earlier today. Libertarians in general, and that includes Narvison, advocate that we pare down the scope of government and that leaves a lot of room for generous people, benevolent people, philanthropic people, charitable people to give of themselves for the unfortunate or the disadvantaged, the poor among us. So libertarians think that there's a vast reservoir of goodwill in people and that if we pull government back from all that it's doing, uh, we will have just as many people taken care of, but we won't have this big government bureaucracy draining off a huge percentage of the wealth. It's a waste of wealth. Better that individuals and their voluntary groups take care of the disadvantaged, right? A direct approach rather than government taking money from some and then transferring it to others. So that's a triangular relationship. Government here, those from whom the money is taken here, those to whom the money is given here. In the situation that I just described, there are just two parties, right? There's the giver and the give, the person, the givee, I guess you could say, the person to whom the resources are given. So libertarians believe that not only is it morally better when we cut the government out, because there's no longer any coercion, and that's a morally better state of affairs, but it's more efficient. We, we're getting rid of the middleman or middle person. The government is acting as the middle person, taking from some, giving to others. So it's more efficient and it's, um, it's morally better as well. Okay, um, talked about responsibility for health, uh, what does a libertarian health care, what does libertarian health care look like? Let's end with this, page 570. Now, Narvison gets a little bit flippant here, which is um, unattractive here, and I'll point out where he does. <clears throat> he says, there's talk of crisis in the air regarding the administrative and taxation burdens of massive health policies, but all this amounts to political castles in the air not reality. If there were no legislation whatever, and all medical transactions were just that, transactions among persons trying to do the best they can, various people would do differently. Some would die earlier than others. Some would die for lack of financial capability to avail themselves of medical treatments, which, in the case were too expensive for their means or the means of persons ready and willing to help. That will always be true, whatever system we have. Well, that part I say is flippant. There'll always be people who die prematurely or go without medical care, whatever system we have, he says. 
but where people are able to make their own decisions and manage their own resources as they will, we may be sure that most people will do reasonably well. Most people, not necessarily all, as generally speaking, they have. <clears throat> life, inspect life expectancy in the Industrial West increased dramatically from the start of the Industrial Revolution to this day, especially before extensive government intervention in the medical system though after it as well. It is not surprising that people in general would rather live longer and healthier lives and are therefore, therefore willing to devote intelligent effort, time and energy, and of course money, to that end. It would be astonishing if they were all the same in the specific levels of health and longevity they were realistically ready to try to achieve. Now that's an interesting point that we haven't discussed. Libertarians love diversity. They, they love the fact that in society, in the same society, we have many different ways of living, many different styles of living. Some people want to accumulate wealth, and they should be able to, according to Narvison. Some people aren't that interested in wealth beyond a certain amount. They want a life of contemplation or recreation or travel. So they want to earn enough to be able to do those things, but they're not particularly interested in accumulating money. Some people want to build a great business and leave that behind as a legacy. Other people are not interested in that sort of thing at all. Some people are risk averse. They're averse to risks. Those are the people who tend to buy insurance. Right? So they're risk averse people. They buy the insurance. And there are, risk, there are people who are risk preferring. There are gamblers. A gambler might say, I'm not buying any health insurance. I may never need it. I'm healthy. I'm young. Uh, I'd rather take the chance. I'd rather bear the risk myself of injury or illness, even catastrophic illness or injury. Right? Those are the gamblers among us. And libertarians salute, celebrate that and salute that. Right? We have, there's room in society for the risk averse. There's room in society for, the, for gamblers or risk-preferring people, and there's room in society for people who are neutral about risk. So we have three types of people, and you can probably fit yourself into one of these categories. In general, there are people who are averse to risk, and they tend to buy insurance against various risks. There are people who are risk-preferring, the gamblers among us. These are the people who go to Las Vegas. Even though in the long run, you can't win against the casinos. People think, I'm going to be lucky. I'm going to swoop into Vegas, make a killing, and get out with the casino's money. Okay, maybe you will. Occasionally someone does, but the odds are against it. Right? Gamblers don't care about that. They, they look at the top side. They say, I want to get rich. I'm going to go in and gamble. They prefer risk. And then there are the risk-neutral people somewhere in the middle. Right? They buy some amount of insurance, but they undertake certain risks um, as well. And libertarians love this. Right? Let a thousand flowers bloom. There should be room in society for every type of person. People who want to buy insurance, people who don't. And among those who do, different amounts of insurance, different types of insurance. Okay, we're almost done. Will there be one size fits all? Well, that ties in with what I'm just saying. Look at the bottom of page 570. Mar Narvison says, let us return one more time to the subject of insurance. Imagine that you are in the medical insurance business in contemporary America or Canada or some other large modern country. What policies would you offer? Well, to begin with, certainly you would not expect that everyone would be interested in just one basic package. And that's for two reasons, three reasons, A, B, and C. A, some, the very, very poor, simply would not be in the market for insurance of any sort. They will have to throw themselves on the charity of others. They can, as a matter of fact, hope to do pretty well at this. As noted, Americans especially are a pretty generous and sympathetic lot of people and unlikely to put up with extensive rectifiable suffering. They would, we may be sure, <clears throat> they meaning the poor, 
they would, we may be sure, be, do far better if most people were not subject to enormous tax bill bills, it should be bills, I think, that drain their financial resources that might otherwise be available for charity. Ooh, that's an interesting point, isn't it? It hasn't come up in our discussion yet, but if we pared back the size of government so that fewer taxes were taken from people, people would have more disposable income and given the charitable nature of most people, they would give some of that money to worthy organizations or individuals. So if people, if someone pays $1,000 in taxes to the government, grudgingly, imagine that the taxes were cut and that person pays only $100 to government. That person has $900 now that would have gone to the government otherwise. That $900 can be spent by me directly to help someone in need. I could, I could purchase a health insurance policy for my neighbor who's raising a large family and can't afford health insurance. Uh, I could donate the money to a church or some other organization that provides health care to the needy. So Narvis is saying if, if we, our taxes are reduced, we have more resources to display our generosity or exercise our generosity. Okay, here's the second point. Others, the quite wealthy, will not buy insurance because there's simply no point. When they need health care, they simply buy it. Okay, so we've got the very poor, and they are on, at the mercy of the generous. We've got the very rich, they don't want insurance. They, they can self-insure. I, I remember something Rush Limbaugh said. I used to listen to his show. He died recently, as you probably know. He owned a very um, large estate in, I think it was West Palm Beach, Florida. Right? Very, very expensive home. And he lives in a place where there are frequent hurricanes. And, of course, a hurricane could come through and destroy his house completely. And I believe he said, I'm pretty sure he said that he does not have homeowner's insurance. And I was shocked to hear that, but he said, look, he's done some calculating. He, he served, he acted as his own actuary. And he said that, that there's a certain chance, yes, that his home will be destroyed by a hurricane. But he calculated that if he paid insurance, he could pay insurance on that home for 20 years and never have to use it because he was lucky enough never to have a hurricane destroy his home. And he decided he would, be, he would take the risk. And he thought that he, uh, he would save a lot of money in insurance premiums. And if he had bad luck and his home got destroyed, he had enough resources to have another home built. So that's one of the luxuries, I suppose, of having lots of money. You can self-insure. Most people don't have that luxury. I know I have a nice home. My wife and I recently bought a new home. And I would not be able to sleep at night if we didn't have homeowner's insurance. The thought that every spark, every uh, broken appliance could destroy our home and we would have nothing to show for everything we've invested in it is, is frightening to me. I guess I'm risk averse to that extent. So I'm happy to pay a premium for homeowner's insurance to give me peace of mind to know that should our house be destroyed, it will be rebuilt. A house of equivalent value will be provided by the insurance that I've paid for. Uh, so not being as wealthy as Rush Limbaugh, there's no way my wife and I could build another house if this one were destroyed. He could. He has enough money, or he had enough money, that if his house were destroyed, even though it was very expensive, he could build another one. So for him, insurance was not um, a viable option. Finally, Narvison says, in between the very, very poor and the quite wealthy, in between are the many for whom there's some point in medical insurance. Especially, this will be insurance against catastrophes of various kinds. By the same token, it should neither cover routine care nor any care up to a certain point. This point is the threshold beyond which the household's ordinary income would be too stretched to cover the full cost of unforeseeably needed medical care. Where that point is will additionally vary a lot. Some families will be able to afford an expenditure of perhaps $2,000 or $3,000 in a year. 
Others will be able to put it at perhaps $10,000 to $20,000. So the point he's making is that people in the voluntary free market for insurance, people will purchase whatever insurance they believe is uh, to their liking or fills their needs. And they'll have to look at how much wealth they have, how much risk they're willing to bear, and what, and they'll shop around. In a free market, there will be all kinds of insurance companies offer, offering all kinds of different packages with different deductibles and co-pays and on and on and on. But it all should be done voluntarily, according to Narvison. Okay, so that is the ideal healthcare system, according to Narvison. It would have a minimum of coercion or compulsion. It would emphasize voluntary uh, transactions. Uh, people should provide, each of us ultimately is responsible for our own health. And each of us has an obligation to work uh, and provide for our needs. And one of our needs obviously is, is health care. He says on page 571, no doubt it is too late to hope for a return to rationality on these matters, but perhaps a few voices in the wilderness will be listened to by some. So that's an interesting point. Narvison must think that the audience for this essay of his is very small. Uh, most people reject outright the idea that there's no positive right to health care. So in some ways he's he's to the extent that he wrote this for his fellow libertarians, he's preaching to the converted. To the extent that he wrote this essay for people who are not libertarians, there's no way they're going to be persuaded. So he feels like he's, he's a voice in the wilderness crying out and no one hears him. I guess that's the metaphor. I don't like it that he said, uh, he said it's too late to hope for a return to rationality on these matters. Once again, he's making a snide remark about those with whom he disagrees. He's implying, I hope you, you can see this, he's implying that if you believe there's a positive right to health care, universal or otherwise, he's implying that you're non-rational. And that's disparaging. You, you never want to say that people you're disagreeing with are not rational. Right? They're rational. He should admit that. It's just that they have different values. They value things like solidarity and, and compassion and taking care of the vulnerable more than they value individual liberty. They, you might say it this way. They value security, health security. They value solidarity with our fellow citizens. And they value concern for others more than they value individual liberty. Libertarians are almost one-dimensional if you'll permit me a, an editorial comment. I used to be a libertarian. The thing that initially appealed to me about it is what eventually turned me off to it. What, it, what appealed to me when I was uh, 24 years old, a law student, when I discovered libertarianism, what appealed to me was that, it, that it, it's a one-dimensional theory. They're called libertarians because they exalt individual liberty. And that one value, individual liberty, explains everything for them. Everything must be justified in terms of that one value. And I like that. It, it provided a simple system that brought a lot of different issues into view. I, I, I had answers for questions on war and peace and the size of government, welfare programs, and uh, the criminal justice system. I had, I had a an answer to all of those questions, and that appealed to me at that time in my life. But it wasn't long, in just a few years, the, the simpleness of libertarianism began to seem simplistic. Notice, the word simplistic is not the same as simple. Simple is a neutral word. It, it's opposed to complex. Simple or complex or complicated. Simplistic means excessively simple, right? Only a simpleton, I came to believe, would accept libertarianism. And that's another disparaging term. When you call someone a simpleton, you're saying you're, you're like a child, unable to notice complexities and take them into account. Uh, you're kind of naive. 
right? You don't, you don't have any sense of subtlety. You're a simpleton. And we describe people's views as simplistic. So all I'm saying, I'm making a, an autobiographical comment right now. I was a libertarian. It's simplicity appealed to me at that time in my life. Later, it seemed simplistic to me. And I've often said disparagingly, and maybe I shouldn't tell you this, but I now consider libertarians like Narvison, uh, I, they have a kind of arrested development. They're, they're stuck at the 11th grade in high school stage, where when you discover something like libertarianism, you say, wow, individual liberty. I love it. I want to be free to do everything I want. All I care about is individual liberty. That's obviously simplistic, right? Because other things in life are, are valuable besides individual liberty. Equality, security, justice, fairness, and so on. So um, I, I began to see the complexity of social life and political theory, and I rejected libertarianism. So people who knew me in law school wouldn't have recognized me by the time I got to graduate school a few years later. I'd, on a 180 on that question. Okay, sorry to bore you with the little autobiography. I suppose by now, we've, we've discussed Hospers and Narvison, you probably are either somewhat attracted to libertarianism, which is fine. I've not tried to disabuse you of that at all. Uh, it appealed to me at a time in my life. It still appeals to Narvison. He's very old now, so he would deny that it's childish at all. Um, so you're either attracted to it and want to learn more about it, or perhaps you are put off by it. Some of you may be appalled by this theory. The idea that you would leave people to fend for themselves, poor, disadvantaged people, people who suffer through no fault of their own uh, because they were born into a poor family or a dangerous neighborhood, people who have illnesses, congenital illnesses, which means illnesses they were born with, or illnesses that came upon them. Uh, a freak accident may have caused a blindness, blind, blindness in someone. Uh, that person's going to be dependent now, unable to do certain jobs. So um, life is full of contingencies and calamities. And in Canada, um, one thing I think they're proud of, maybe justly proud of, is that they feel a sense of solidarity with one another. They're not individuals unconnected, floating in their bubbles. They feel as though they're in, they're in solidarity. They're part of something larger than themselves. They feel that they have a sense of concern for one another, even if they're strangers, someone in Alberta and someone in Ontario. They're still both Canadians. They're part of the same society and they pay taxes to the same government, and they feel connected and bound to one another. And that makes them feel good. So I suspect you're either appalled by libertarianism uh, or you are somewhat attracted to it. And I encourage you to read more about it, learn more about it, as I did. You may find that you become a thoroughgoing libertarian uh, and remain one your whole life, or perhaps you will have a transformation and you'll move on to another political philosophy after that. All right, sorry I kept you a little bit long. I think I covered everything I want to. And when I see you again next week, remember, it might be as late as Thursday because I have other things to do. Um, so maybe your two lectures next week will be Thursday and Saturday. But I'll send an email as soon as they're posted. Until then, have a nice weekend and a nice few days. You should um, start reading the essay by Jubilini and Minerva. I will post my lecture notes on that essay in the next day or so. All right, see you next week.